or going to perform, that they're not already performing. They're already buying the food, preparing the food, cooking the food, serving the food, washing the dishes. So what are other jobs are they going to do? Are they now going to do it whilst whistling? Are they going to do it on skates? Yeah, but they're going to be are a lot more to... conscientious, well, aren't they? Well, it doesn't matter how more conscientious they are, what are they going to produce that they're not producing now? No, but it's how they do it, isn't well, it? No, it's it isn't, way... because the restaurant doesn't give a cuss how they do it. He cares about how much piggy money they get. Depending on which restaurant, if you well, work in no, a no, restaurant... No, 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 don't start splitting airs with me about which restaurant. No, because... A restaurant, a particular restaurant, is currently working with a wages bill of £800. It's not going to increase its revenue... Or is it? Is it going to put its prices up? Right, Alan. Is it going to put its prices up? Yeah. Ah, oh, there we got it. So, right, can I ask no, you don't need to go any further. We've established now that no matter what the staff do, at the end of the day, to get that extra 200 quid in the case of this restaurant we've created, the restauranter is going to put up the price. Yes? Can I ask you a question? Is that yes or no? Yeah. But I'm going to justify does that, that. Does that apply to every other industry where you want a minimum wage? No, because... No, so you think there are some industries where the, the management will say, oh, that's a good idea, here are kids, have some more money. Yeah, no, I won't put it on the prices now, nah, I'll have a loss this week, be all right. Can I justify it? You can try. Can I ask you a question? You when you ask. go to a restaurant mm -hmm. and you tell people of how you viewed a restaurant, what do you judge a restaurant on? I judge it on a number of things. Um, these days, I'm judging it on whether I get food poison or not, because I <laughs> did on Friday. Oh, God. And I sat and did this programme going out every half hour to throw up. Thank you very much to the restaurant that served me that wonderful salmonella. However, the truth is that it's a number of things. But the main one, I've got to say, is the food. So what, so what? How would you judge the food in comparison to the service? I didn't mention the service. Yeah, if but the food's right, then that's the most important thing to me. Yeah, but if you get a fantastic meal... You just asked me a question, you got an answer. Do you not like it? Yeah, but I'm, you just, do trying like to, I'm ju just trying to understand it. If you get a fantastic meal and mm. you get it slapped onto your plate by a, a waitress who couldn't give a damn whether you liked it or not, mm -hmm. would you walk out happy? Depends on what it tasted like. Would that not affect your judgment? Should the bad so. service? No, I, I eat with my teeth and my mouth. Yeah, but you go to a restaurant for the whole atmosphere, don't you? You go no, for the good service. No, I go service. for something to eat. Yeah, but if you're going for something to eat, then you might as well just go to Sainsbury's and cook it yourself. You go no, for the I service. No, I go to get somebody else to cook it for me to eat. OK, then you get somebody into your house who's, who... You go to Wimpy's or somewhere like that. I don't eat Wimpy's. Or you go to somewhere like that, a quick food thing. I don't go to places like that. I avoid them like the plague. Because I don't like the food. Well, if you did... The service is great. You go to McDonald's, you wait 30 seconds, you can have all the McDonald's you want. You go to Wimpy, they'll give you 35,000 of them if you want to wait five minutes. I don't want to wait five minutes, I want to eat. And I don't like the muck they serve. Yeah, but the service is important, isn't it? You keep telling me it is, but I don't really care. If somebody throws a meal at me, and I like the flavour of it, I'm happy. If the service is wonderful, it makes me throw up, then I'm not happy. Yeah, but if you get a bad meal, but you get waiters and waitresses who try to make it good for I've you... I've never got food poisoning through bad service. Yeah, but you certainly wouldn't enjoy it as much, would you? Not with food poisoning, no. No, you wouldn't enjoy the, it's the, the good meal. It's a, look, if you're trying to get me to say something that I'm not going to say, you might as well give up. But the thing is... No, the thing isn't. You want me to say the most important thing is this service. No, well, I'm not. And complete I'm bullshit. not saying the most important thing is. Right, so let's get it out of the way. For, will, you will you tell me who the Piginelli is going to give this extra 200 quid to the restaurateur? That's all I want to know. It's a simple question, even for a pleb like you. So, come on, who's going to give him the 200 notes? Well, I think... Oh, just the tell me! Good. They should put on a service charge. OK, and so what you mean is the punter's going to yeah. pay it. Well, what a pig and did you say? I've got a blade in houses about whether I like it, whether I don't like it, whether I get food poisoning, whether it's a wimpy, whether it's Sainsbury's, you pleb. I'll do, Karen. Hello, Al. Yeah. Um, can you explain this poll tax to me? Because I can't make head and a tail of yeah, it at the moment. In its simplest form, and we've only got the rumours and the government's very superficial explanation of what it is at the moment. But at the moment, 
the premises are what are used to decide how much the rates are going to cost, yes? Yes. So in other words, if you live in a house that's got <coughs> central heating, five bedrooms detached with an acre of land, it's going to cost you more than the house next door that's got two bedrooms, no central heating and no garden, yes? Yes. Right. Now then, the house doesn't actually use, the house itself is a building, bricks, mortar, what have you, doesn't actually use any of the services that the local authority provide, does it? The people do, the house itself doesn't, does it? No, go on. House never turns a tap on, people do. Eh? Yeah. The house never puts out the dustbins, the people do. The house doesn't create any rubbish, the people do. You with me? Yeah. Okay. The house has no requirement for street lights or public toilets or cemeteries, does it? The people do. So, this five bedroom detached house in an acre of land costs more in terms of the services, the charge for services levied by the local authority, called rates, than does the two bedroomed terraced cottage in the same street, right? Right. Okay. What the poll tax is going to do, it's going to say, and we're going to imagine a figure now, let us imagine a city, a particular city, X, yeah, mm. needs to get in £10 million to operate. To operate all those services I just mentioned, you know, like the public loos, the street lighting, and all that rubbish, needs 10 million quid. Yeah. At the moment, it gets that 10 million quid by deciding how much each premise is going to pay, each property. They're called hereditaments. All right? Which? They're called hereditaments. Funny word, isn't it? It is, yeah. But they're, let's call them homes. So it says, all right, all these homes, that big home over there has got to pay this much money, that little home over there has got to pay this much money, which is considerably less, right? Mm. Now, when you think about it, that's silly, because if the big house with five bedrooms and an acre of land has one little old lady in it, then she's not going to make a lot of rubbish. She's certainly not going to make much use of the street lights and the public toilets and all the rest of the facilities of the local authority. Whereas the little terrace cottage next door may have a family of eight living in it. Now they're going to use a lot more, aren't they? They're going to make more rubbish for the council to dispose of. They're going to walk down more streets and therefore use more of the street light, if you like. They're going to use the public toilets more often. They're going to use public transport more often. They're going to use education more often. So all the costs that the local authority has to pray for mm. are going to be going towards this house with the two bedrooms that's paying tiny rates. So what the poll tax is, it's going to put a tax on human beings. It's going to say, it doesn't matter how big your house is or how small your house is, it's the number of people living in it and therefore using the facilities provided. Okay? Yeah. And that's all it is. So there's still, this city will still need 10 million quid to operate, but the way it will divide up the cost of its operation won't be in accordance with how big your house is, or where it is in the town, but on the basis of how many people there are in the town. So if this house, if this, sorry, if this local authority with 10 million people in it, 10 million pounds needed, has 10 million people, then they'll all pay a pound, no matter how many live together. Yeah. That's the gist of it. Does that make sense? It doesn't, it doesn't. What I can't... When, when I say, does it make sense, I don't mean do you agree with it, I mean... Do you understand what it's doing? It sounds fairer the way you've put it than the way I've read about it. Well, it depends who wrote what you read on whether they make it sound fair or not. Well, it was the Liverpool Echo. They done um, a family of six yeah. and Lord and Lady Derby or yes. something like that. Yes. And it turned out this poor family of six, like they're going to get fleeced, and Lord and Lady Derby, who've got more money anyway are going to come out with more money. You know, money goes to money, that type of thing. Well, it isn't quite like that, because if they'd have, instead of taking Lord and Lady Derby, if they'd have taken Mr and Mrs Joe Plug living in Liverpool 8, they too would have a reduction, because there's only two of them. You see, my rates will go down, and I'm obviously reasonably well off. But my next-door neighbour's rates will also go down, 
and they're not quite as well off as I. Now, others, other people in the area, obviously people with large families, their rates will go up. But I'm told, and we don't yet know because it isn't even a bill yet, it isn't even gone into the Houses of Parliament yet properly, but we're told that they will only charge adults over the age of 18. There's not going to be a charge for children. Now, I don't know how true that is. We'll have to wait and see. But imagine the family that's got six children, but they've all grown up and they're all living at home. Mm. Now, though, that family with these eight people living in there, all of whom may well be wage earners, are paying the same rates as the family next door, who's got no children. Now, that's not fair, is it? Because no. these dirty, great, clumping human beings next door are using all the services and getting them for the same price as two well, people. Well, all right, say you've got a family of six. Mm -hmm. Yes. Six adults, say. Mm -hmm. And two of them are on the dole. Mm -hmm. No, them two that are on the dole, what happens to their toll tax? The answer to that is we don't yet know. Currently, there is a system of rate rebate. Mm. And people on low incomes, or indeed no income, get a rebate off their rates so that those who are in work, people like me, hopefully people like you but I don't know, but those of us who are in work pay a little extra on our rates that covers, or, or when they charge our rates, they take into account that some people are going to get them for free or get them cheap. Yeah? Mm, yeah. So they take that into consideration. It may well be that they will apply a similar system when the poll tax arrives. I don't know. None of us know. We have our suspicions, of course. And when is this poll tax probably going to come into action? <laughs> we don't know that either. The government says, and it said in the Queen's speech, that it hopes to get through it in, certainly in the next couple of years. It wants it in existence before the, uh, before the end of this session of Parliament, this five years that the government now has available to it. So they want it done before then. I would expect that they want it done within a couple of years so that they've got two or three years for people to get over the shock of it. And in the view of this current government, not necessarily mine, and I'm not saying which because I'll have to wait and see, but in the view of this current government, they'd like to get it over with fairly early on in their term of office so that all the problems with it can be ironed out and everyone will be seeing the benefit of it. I mean, Norman Tebbit said in an interview on radio yesterday that in five years' time, people will be saying, how did we ever manage with rates? Mm. Yeah? Whether we will or not remains to be seen, but that's what Mr Tebbit believes and he's entitled to it, I suppose. OK? Mm. OK. Does that explain it? Um. Sort of. <laughs> All right, then. I'm a thick scouser, I'm afraid. Well, you're not a thick scouser. You're a very clever scouser because you just put three words in one line. Ooh. All right, love. Oh, pass on the back for me, then. <laughs> ta ra ta ra, -ra. How do, Margaret? Hi, Alan. Yes? I wonder if you can help me with a crossword. It's um, three letters and it's a former Ugandan leader. Iddy. How do you spell that? I-D-I. O-D-O. Ah, oh, rats! <laughs> you have been busy. I have. Where's my thing? You miserable pig! I hope you. Never mind. <laughs> Bezic. Happy <laughs> Bezic. Bye, Alan. I knew it was a gang. I just couldn't work it out. <laughs> Ta-da, Bye. You deserve that one. You deserve flogging. Moving home. Well, move in the right direction with Edward Jackson's long-established estate agents and surveyors and a member of the Pioneer Mutual Group of Companies. We'll answer all your queries like, how much can I sell my home for? How do I go about it? How much will it cost? Do I need a surveyor solicitor? Where can I buy my next home? Which is the best mortgage for me? For the answers to these and other questions, consult the professionals and move in the right direction with Edward Jackson's. For more information, call Edward Jackson on 0695 76061. That's 0695 76061. Carpets. Red ones, green ones, yellow and blue. We've got the carpets just for you. At the Carpet Supermarket, Fletcher Road off Ribbleton Lane, Preston. Open seven days a week. Also at Long Lane, Aintree. J Max Clothes Shop for Family Wear. J Max Half Price Clothing Sale starts this Thursday, the 30th of July. Our already crazy prices have been slashed by 50%, so make sure you and all your family take advantage of this once in a lifetime offer now. You'll recognize the styles and be amazed at the quality. But even more important, you'll love the half prices on selected garments. J Max Half Price Clothing Sale starts Thursday, the 30th of July throughout the Northwest. J Max throughout the Northwest. 
Hello, Alan. I'd yep. like to talk about driving on motorways, please. Go on. Well, I think for the start that the speed limit doesn't cause most of, most of the accidents. I think it's driving too close myself. I think I'd be prepared to agree with you. And uh, most of the people, I mean, if they look in the highway code book, they think if they're going fast, they have to stay in the fast lane. But it's just a class as an overtaking lane, really, isn't it? Well, there are three lanes. There is the near side lane that is for normal transport and travelling. There is the middle lane that is for overtaking and there is the outside lane that is for overtaking those who are overtaking in the middle lane. That's right, yes. I know it's right. I mean, the only reason they brought the speed limit in really was during the war when there was not much petrol around. But what they said then, they took the speed limit down to 70 miles an hour from no restriction. And then after the so long of there being a speed limit, they said, oh, well look... The speed limit on the motorways didn't exist during the war because we didn't actually have the motorways. Yes, well, he knocked the national speed limit down to 70 mile an hour, and then he said... Yeah, but I don't think it was during the war, and the motor vehicles that were available during the war weren't particularly capable of 70 miles an hour. Well, but never mind, why, why ever they did it. I think it was in the 60s when they introduced it. Yes, well, then he said, oh, well, there's been less accidents since this uh, speed limit has been introduced, but the fact is because there's been less people driving because the petrol, petrol was too dear. No, wherever they've introduced a speed limit, and whenever there's, they have introduced a speed limit, there has been a reduction in accidents, almost in proportion there to that reduction. Well, uh, myself, I think speed has got very little to do with it. Well, you're wrong. Indeed, well, well, obviously indeed, well, listen, listen, you say you're driving too close. Now, you tell me what distance you should be from the car in front. Well, it really depends on the conditions, doesn't it? OK, it depends on the conditions. Let us say it is, if you could have such a thing, a perfect road, a dry day, on a straight road. What distance should you be from the car in front? If you go in what speed? I thought speed had nothing to do with it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Good night. You have been besicked. How do, Marion? How do, John? All right, Al. Yes? What, what do you feed your cat on? Why do you want to know? Because I want to know. I asked you why. Because, because there's some uh, very bad uh, cat foods out now, you know. Oh, well, there you go. So, go ahead. What do you feed you your cat? You haven't told me why you want to know, and I'm not sure that because, because I'm worried about your cat. Well, I shouldn't be if I were you. I am. Well, you just have to worry. So you start biting your nails or something. Now, go on. What do you feed them now? Listen, I've walked into one trap tonight. I'm not walking into another. Good night. <laughs> it's very nearly midnight, which means, of course, it's time for this and then the news. <laughs> the midnight news. This is Sarah Jones. Israel is stepping up its effort to bring an alleged Nazi war criminal now living in Scotland to trial. Sources in Jerusalem say that unless Britain takes action against the suspect, the Israeli government will. John Taylor reports. The Simon Wiesenthal Centre says that Antonas Gikas from Edinburgh once belonged to a Nazi unit which caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Lithuanian Jews, a claim which he strongly denies. The Home Office says Mr. Gikas can't be tried in this country, nor can he be extradited to Israel because the crimes allegedly happened in Russia and therefore aren't covered by the treaty. Meanwhile, Nazi hunter Rabbi Marvin Heer has vowed to bring Mr. Gikas to trial. He says if Britain won't do it, then the Israeli government will have to step in. Two Britons are among more than 700 people who've died during the blistering heat wave hitting Greece. A 46-year-old Oxfordshire woman has died from dehydration and a 57-year-old South Yorkshire woman, holidaying on the island of Zante, died after suffering sunstroke. Temperatures of over 100 degrees are set to continue for the next few days. But Britons flying out there are being philosophical about what they'll find. As long as I'm careful, drink plenty of water, that should be OK. Well, I'm going there on business, so, uh, yes, I have slight trepidation. I'm glad I'm not going there on holiday, I think. If you're careful, if you know what you're doing, there's no risk at all. You know, several hundred people have already died in these temperatures. People are dying all the time. I don't know whether it's due to heat or other things. 
A street trader who was selling copies of the controversial spy catcher book has been arrested in London. 25-year-old Ian Clive Wills has so far only been charged with obstruction and unlawful street trading. But Scotland Yard say they're consulting with the Attorney General, who's still fighting to stop the book of ex-MI5 agent Peter Wright's memoirs being published in British newspapers. An RAF tornado jet has crashed on Moorland in North Yorkshire. The two crew bailed out while the fighter was on low-level training flight. John Ogden reports. The tornado was flying over the village of Kirby Moorside when the pilot lost control. He and the navigator parachuted to safety while the tornado exploded in a cornfield. Local farmer Robert Ibbotson says the plane disintegrated. Everything shook in the village. I think the thing come down and then the big mushroom of smoke and a, a red flash of flames and that happened, seemed to happen twice. And that was it. The pilot is unhurt and the navigator escaped with just a broken arm. RAF investigators are now trying to find out what went wrong. John Ogden, IRN, North Yorkshire. Britain's restaurants and cafes have been branded a health hazard, with the number of reported cases of food poisoning doubling in 10 years. The Institute of Environmental Health Officers is warning that people will die unless they're given greater powers to force offenders to clean up. Assistant Secretary of the Institute, Clive Wadey, says some shops and restaurants are unbelievably filthy. There's just mouse droppings on the floor, there's bird droppings uh, around. I mean, this thing shouldn't, just shouldn't happen. Refrigerators and, and freezers which have, haven't been defrosted for, for months. And that sort of thing, it's, it's just fundamental, it's basic, and it's a, it's a totally irresponsible attitude on the, on the part of managers. Independent Radio News. Ring him if you dare. Late night show. And it's three and a half minutes past midnight. Welcome to Tuesday. If you wish to join us on the phone in, the number is Preston 56 1000. 24 hours a day, Red Rose Radio. How do Lee. Hi, Al. What do you want? Uh, well, there's this couple, right, just gone on the honeymoon to a seaside resort. And uh, they've stayed in this hotel, and after the end of the first night, this uh, host of the hotel... He's gone up to the room, you see, because we've not been down for anything to eat. So he has to chat. He can't say anything to eat. He says, no, thanks. It's all right, Al. Anyway, at the end of the second night, they've still not been down, so this chap goes up again. And he still wants anything to eat, this couple. So at the end of the week... I hate jokes that go on for hours. Oh, good just a minute, Al. Let me finish. It's good, this. So... I hate jokes that go on for hours. Yeah, I know you do. You said, just let me finish. Right. At the end of the week, uh, he's, uh, been... I hate jokes that have er uh, in them. Right, OK. At the end of the week, there's uh, this I fella... I hate jokes that have er uh, in them. Right, OK. This fella, at the end of the week, they've still not been down for anything to eat, so he says, um, well, why have you not been eating anything? I hate so jokes that this, have uh, er um, in it. This fella, he says... Uh, I hate jokes that right, have er uh, um, in it. Living on and er. Uh, how do... Pat. Oh, hello, Alan. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you say it, uh, earlier in a conversation about the underpaid in the north that um, the um, it wasn't illegal to pay low wages? That, that is correct in most circumstances. Oh no, I was just I'd actually just been reading in the local paper and it was quoted the low pay. Unit director said the majority of employees covered by the wage council in the northwest observe the rules, and it sh they should not be subjected to unfair competition by cowboy firms operating illegally. And with you talking about the report, I thought, well, that's odd. I just read that, and this report says they are illegal to pay that low wages. No, what it says is that those industries covered by the Wages Council are breaking the law by not paying the correct rate of pay. But the vast majority of industries are not covered by the Wages Council. In the main, it covers the catering industry and shop industry. But the vast majority of other industries... In so, if someone's working, say, for one of these cowboy firms, as they put it in the paper, and... Um 
um, they report it, so nothing's been done about it. They're turning a blind eye. Very little, very little is done about it because it's not reported. Because people, when they go for the job in these days of three or four million unemployed, depending on whose figure you believe, people are just happy to have a job. And the cowboy firms, as they're described, are taking advantage of that situation. Yeah, in this report it says, um, but it uh, points out that only two of the 8,200 firms caught underpaying last year were prosecuted. Well, um, if they were caught in the pain, why don't the government do something about it? Then? Well, you have to bear in mind that they were caught paying below the rate recommended and indeed insisted upon by the Wages Council, and mm. it is this government that is trying to abolish the Wages Council. Mm. So they're hardly likely to encourage prosecutions for breaches of the Wages Council regulations when they think the Wages Council shouldn't be there anyway. All right. All right. Nice. Bye-bye. <laughs> How do Steve? How do Al? Yes. Well, I did my driving test the other day. Now, it was around the streets of Wigan. Have you been to Wigan recently? No. Well, they're doing a lot of road working. Oh, yes, I have. But go on, anyway. Yeah. Well, have you, have you seen them? Which ones? Well, they're all over Wigan Town Centre these days. All right. Yeah. Well, I was doing my driving test, and at one point in the test, you told me to turn right where it was a no entry. Now, perhaps it had changed over the last couple of days, and he didn't know, you see. Now, can I appeal, because cause he failed me on the test, can I appeal? Did you turn in where it said no entry? No, eventually, you know, he told me to, but, like, I had to swerve across the lane, you see. Do you mean you were going to? Yeah, well, I didn't know, you see, same as him. Do you not know about that? Circle they have on a stick, a sort of red oh, thing. I couldn't see it, Alan. You couldn't see it? Oh, I see. You're a blind driver. Well, it must be very difficult for you. How do Sue? I'll do, Alan. Can we just go back, please, to the man who was talking about the drivers on the motorways? Yes. I, I travelled on the motorway during this past week, and a lot of the accidents, I, I believe, are caused by... I was in the middle lane, and somebody indicated to come right... And I don't know whether they looked or not, but he just pulled out straight in front of me with feet to spare and causing me to have to go into the fast lane. Now, there was no one behind me, but I mean, I wasn't doing over the speed limit and it's a good job there wasn't anybody coming up in the fast lane behind me, otherwise it would have been curtains for somebody. So I, th I, I think that when you've taken your driving test, you should take another test once you're a qualified driver. I believe you should take another test on a motorway with a qualified instructor because I, was, I know you've got your highway code book and everything, but I mean, apart from having the actual experience, how do people learn? I'm forced to agree with you. Entirely. I mean, when I passed my test, I got my dad to go on the motorway with me and sit with me. You know, while I actually had some experience on the motorway, so why can't they bring something in like that? I don't know why they can't, other than it would take time, parliamentary time, of which there is a premium, or which is at a premium, and also it would cost money, because someone would have to organise the tests and pay for the tests. So, those are the reasons. I don't know whether it would make a great deal of difference, but I still think it should be done, just like you do. I mean, All you right? pay for your driving test, so well, surely you, you could pay for another one. Yes, you do pay for your driving test, but unfortunately it doesn't cover the cost of that oh, driving test. I see. <laughs> it costs considerably more than you pay. Yeah. But, it, fine, I think it's a great idea. Well, I think somebody should bring it in. <laughs> well, <laughs> whether anybody will or not remains to be seen. All right? OK, OK, thanks, thanks Alan. Bye. How do you, Mark? Why not? Hello, Mark. Hello, uh, Alan. Yes. Uh, just imagine, right, if you're in the pub, suddenly the roof came down, Tom Jones appeared and started to sing. It's not unusual. It's not to be loved <laughs> by anyone. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I'd leave any pub that had Tom Jones in it, to be honest. Please listen to my ditty. It may not be very witty, nor even slightly funny, but it will help save you money. For me, from cradle to grave, I aim to shop and save. I buy out I need, for next to out indeed. There's meat and veg and cheese and bicks and booze and clothes and cards and sweets and pigs and pet food and household things. So, shop and save a load down Blackpool's Waterloo Road. In the market they call new, and over at Road, the M2. Thank you. Poetry in prices. From the new market and M2 market. It's the place to come, where shopping can be fun. Newmarket Waterloo Road 
It's the time that you take It's a coat, it's a break It's a pause in the beat A go from the heat Ah, oh, just what I need It's the hit, Coca-Cola is it Put them on hold That coat is ice cold It's the thing you wait Don't care if I'm late It's just how you feel It's a break that's for real It's a kick, it's a hit, it's a go It's a kick, it's a hit, it's a go Coca-Cola is it Zamunic Beer Festival is famous throughout the world for everyone to have a good time. There's more barrels than at the OK Corral, and departure dates are the 17th or the 24th of September or the 1st of October. You'll stay at the classy Gastov Zillertal in Strass, if we can drag you away from the bar, that is. And the cost, half board, is just £99. But make sure you ring Avalon Travel today, because this is on a first-come, first-served basis. Get it? Avalon Travel, phone Bolton, 398788. I'll do Simon. Now, um, good evening. Good evening. Um, I just like to say, because this is the first night I've actually had a chance to listen to you. I've been recommended by somebody to tune in to you. You're going to get to your point? Um, you well, yes, go? I'm going to get good. to the point. Good, get to well. it now. Uh, could you just tell me if the ingredients of your show is actually based on what James Stanich was doing for Piccadilly a few well, years you, ago? You tell me. You obviously have well, some I mean, experience of James Stanich, so well, you tell I, what me. What I've heard of Stanich... You? T- what do you mean, what you've heard of him? Did you well, hear his programme? I've, I've heard a tape of his one of his programmes. And you will find what? He was very aggressive. And I was just wondering if um, your producers have actually... Based I haven't got a producer. Uh, there must be a producer what... Uh, you can must all you like, there isn't. I'm the producer. Well, I mean, the must, I mean you, you, well, how do you get away with what you do then? I have no idea, but on the evidence of the last 12 so months... How come would you I- like an answer to your question or wouldn't you? Well, go on. Well, if you don't say so, I'm not going to well, trouble well, you with answers. Well, go on then, ask me the no, question. No, okay. I said, would you like an answer to your question? I would like question? an answer to the question then. Well, you're not having one. Why not? Because if you can't be bothered to wait for the answer, I'm damned if I'm going to be bothered to give you the answer. Well, uh, well, uh, oh. Don't give me all this well, but, but, oh, well, but, but, well, but, but, well, but, but, I don't care about well, but, 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 well, but, but, well, but, but, well, but, but, calm down. I don't have to calm down, I'm getting paid to be angry. Yeah, you're getting paid to copy Stanich. Well, if that's how you see it, that is how you must look. I'll tell you what, could I just say another thing? Listen, my immature little friend, can we really just get to terms with it? Right. If you think this is a copy of anybody in the world, that's fine by me. How come this That is fine by me. His name is Jim Reeve. Oh, what, is, is there isn't an S on what you're doing? I have no idea. You must address your question to him. Well, I, th- I think you're trying to copy Stanich. Well, you've said that. So what do you want me to do? Weep? Well, I mean... What do you want me to do? Don't say, well, I mean, well, I mean, well, I mean. We've heard all your drivelling crap. Now tell me what you want I me to do. I think you're a fat-eating, carrot-headed gobshite. A, f- a what? Fat-eating? No, never mind that. What was the first bit? A big fat-eating Fat-eating? I don't eat fat. No, you eat Mars bars, though. Oh, you mean that kind of fat. Oh, well, I didn't realise you were so intellectual. How do... Nobody. I'll do line seven. Come on, Rod. I'll do Adrian. Hello, Alan. I'd like to talk about this uh, multimillionaire I once knew. And the doctors told him he was going to die. And so did he? Sorry? Did he? Yes, he did. Good. The doctor was right. I'll do line eight. Philip. Hello, Alan. Yes. Thanks for the closest between the Valentine's Can't hear you. I'd like to put the closest we live in was in the Valentine's Hold it, Valentine's hold it, hold it, hold it. You're going to have to speak slower. I'd like to put the closest we live in. You're not speaking slower. I'd like to put the closeness we live in between the Valentine's Well, I'd like... Hang on. Correct me if this is... I'm not sure what you've said. You seem to have said, I'd like to talk about the closeness we live in. The Valentine's Society. Hold it, hold it, hold it! Is that what you've said? The Valentine's Society. Hold it! Have you... All I've heard so far is what sounded to me like I would like to talk about the closeness we sorry, live sorry, in. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Doesn't tell me whether that was what you right. said or not. Right what the Vaughan Society we live in and the closeness... You talk, we... Look, can we just establish... Each word has to end before the other one begins, otherwise I cannot comprehend what it is you're attempting right. to communicate right. to me. Right. 
the vast society we live in. Like what? The, the what? The hold it, hold it. The what? The violent society. Violent? Violent. Oh, violent. My yeah. apologies. Try, try to express your words and then I might know what they what they are, let alone I what they mean. A closeness between the VAR. The va violent society we live in. Yes. Compared to the foods we eat. You think there's a closeness between the violent society? How can you have a closeness between? Well, that's only I can think of it. Uh, putting it, Alan. I see. So you think there's a closeness in the violent society we live in? Yeah. To the things that we eat? A similarity, Alan. A similarity? Yeah. I think what you're trying to say is you think there is some relationship that's, that's between correct. our diet that's correct, yeah. and the violence experienced by that's many correct. people. That's correct. Explain. Well, Slowly. For example, I read the other day in one of the newspapers that a chap in America was, in, um, was given the drug of, maybe not the drug, but was given potato injected into his blood and he turned very hyperactive. I think there's a bit as... Between that, the food we eat these days, the volatile society we live in. How do you inject a potato? Well, the, the, the sort of it's It'll not come out the needle, will it? A potato? Pardon? It'll not come out the needle. I mean, you're not going to chip through a needle, let alone a full potato. That's right, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's well, maybe he's allergic to potatoes. Well, I'm talking about things like that. There's a chap I know in work on who his son cannot drink um, a certain brand of orange juice without going hyperactic and smashing the place up. Oh, well, tell him not to drink it then. Well, that's what I'm saying. There's a, there is a, um, some sort of closeness between them. And Potato flavoured orange juice. For example, Alan, like um, cheeseburgers, etc. Like the things that people eat in this country. I think there is some sort of closeness between the vast society they live in. Yeah, you said. Pardon? You said so. Yes. Do you think that the vast society we live in got something to do, the relationship that we, the people that we live in, it's got something to do with what they eat? I think it might have. Do you think so? I think it might have. But what I'm saying is, the things that we eat, I yeah, I know, yes, I know what you're saying. Yeah, no, no, it's all right. I know, I know what you're saying. I don't need to hear it again. But do you think it's, think, you think it's true that the, the way... I think it might be. The way people eat, it's, it affects their behaviour in society. It might do. I mean, if you don't eat, you fall over a lot. How do... F not Philip, that was him. How do Derek? Hello, Alan. Yeah. It's about the lady who was on about the motorway. Yes. You know, about taking a test. Mm. Well, I've always just passed my test with Styles at Leyland. And we don't uh, want to know the name of the company. I'm sorry. Goodbye. Adverts cost money on this program. How do John? Hello, oh, well, Alan. It's the same subject again about the uh, motorway and driving. Yes. Uh, when the lady was talking about it before, she made a comment about learning the drivers how they should possibly have to take an extra test to go on motorways. Most accidents on motorways are certainly not caused by learners. Um, and most bad driving isn't exercised by no, learners. I don't, I don't actually think she was... Um, even suggesting that they were, unless you accept the analogy or accept the status that a person is a learner until they've completed learning. What she was saying was the accidents on motorways, in her view, were caused by people who did not know how to use the motorway properly. And the reason they didn't know is very few people are ever taught. Yeah, well, I'm a qualified driving instructor. Now, I teach, like a lot of my colleagues teach, we teach motorway driving. Obviously, working within the confines of the law, we can't take a learner onto a motorway. But they must show, when they go for their driving test, a fairly thorough knowledge of motorway procedure. Well, yes, but that's rather like buying a copy of HMSO book driving and sending the person off to the driving test, isn't it? And saying, well, if you turn the wheel this way, the car will go left. You actually need to experience it in order to learn it you as a driving instructor will indeed contribute to that belief. Otherwise, you wouldn't exist. It, the driving examination will be a written examination. Yeah, you find though, that uh, most bad driving on motorways is caused by the, the more experienced drivers, and the main cause of accidents on motorways is lack of mirror use, which is something that's drummed into learners. Experienced drivers do not yes, use their mirrors. Yes, but that still means that people should 
or it still allows, and you obviously contribute to this belief, otherwise you wouldn't do what you do, mm -hmm. that people should be taught how to drive on a motorway. I am not, just like our earlier caller was not suggesting, that inexperienced drivers be taken on the motorway, people who have never driven a motor car be taken on the motorway, people who have not shown their capability at least of being able to manoeuvre a vehicle in traffic being taken on the motorway. Mm -hmm. But once you have passed your test, you should not be allowed on the motorway until you have taken a further test. It doesn't need to be a particularly complex test, but until you've shown yourself capable of actually moving that vehicle around on the motorway safely, rather like the heavy goods people do. Heavy goods vehicle drivers are allowed on the motorway. Heavy goods vehicle learner drivers are allowed on the motorway, as you know. That's right. But they're not allowed on if they've not actually got the ordinary driving test. I, too, used to be a driving instructor. I, too, used to offer a lesson, a two-hour motorway lesson afterwards. Yeah, that's right. A, because the money was nice, mm -hmm. just like it is in any business, and B, because I thought it was actually valuable. Yeah. I, in fact, I would argue it was essential. Yeah. But not everybody took the opportunity of it. I think an idea with, with recently qualified drivers would be the use of uh, R plates, similar to the use in Southern Ireland. Well, it's Northern Ireland and is the N. The, yeah, it's like a restricted driver, driver plate. That's right. I think it'd be a great idea, you know. And it'd let other people know that the person has recently passed the test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, put them on a probationary period. Well, yes, that's an excellent idea. That is what our earlier, co earlier caller suggested and then said they ought to have a test at the end of that period, which strikes me as being perfectly sensible. Yeah, OK. OK, I'll, cheers. cheers. How do, Chris? How do? Hello? What do you want? Uh, I'm thinking of working abroad. How do I go about, how do I go about it? It rather depends on the country in which you wish to work. In the United States. You, you give up all hope, if you've any sense. What occupation do you have? Fitter. You've got to get sponsored by an employer over there. Yeah. And the chances of that are very, very slim indeed. Oh. OK. All right. Right, though. I should get in touch with the American consulate and discuss the problems involved with them. All right. Where are they? There's one in... I think the only one, actually, is in London. London. Yeah. Right. Okay. You'll get it out of Whitaker's Almanac, which you will find at your local library. Glendon Motors, Peugeot, you get lots more for your money at Glendon Motors, and especially this month with 0% finance on a choice of petrol 309s from the economical 1100s and 1300s to the sporting 1600s. Ask for written details. Make the most of this fabulous opportunity and bring your used car because we're giving unbelievable part exchange prices. Remember, 0% finance and top part exchange prices only at Glendon Motors Blackpool Road, Preston. Phone 735 811. Glendon Motors, Peugeot, it's back to school with Slaters for massive stocks of school uniforms at low, low prices. Why pay through the nose when Slaters stock the lot? Fully lined washable blazers from eleven ninety nine, school shirts from two ninety nine, trousers and skirts from four ninety nine, and ties and socks from sixty nine pence. More choice and lowest prices at Slaters. Branches at Preston, Wigan, Ashton in Makerfield, Lee, Bolton, St Helens, and Warrington. Make sure your child goes back to school with Slaters. How do David? How do Alan? Um, I rang the other night and uh, asked you whether you thought 17 year olds claiming unemployment benefit got enough money. You said you didn't know and um, you said the parents had kept them all that time, so why would a couple more years uh, make any more difference? Um, well, I think that 17-year-olds who are claiming unemployment benefit, they know that the parents have kept them all that time, so they want to get a job and pay them for what they've done, but they don't get a chance. And, this, and the YTS scheme money, that, that doesn't seem to be enough either. So you think the state should give them money merely because they have this pathetic idea that they want to give their parents some money back? Yeah, because like... The Why should it? Why should the state allow you to repay your parents for the debt that you don't actually have? They brought you into the world, they got the responsibility of feeding you. You don't owe them nothing. No, but it's just what people think, you know, you... Well, I'm not over-bothered what people think. We can't have the government spending my hard-earned tax income simply to help your patronising little dross emotions, can we? Well, rather than have people on door, why don't they put up the YTS money? 
that would solve some problems because they, if they put the YTS money up, more young uh, people, 17 year olds, just leaving school and that would go on the YTS because they will feel it's worth it. <laughs> They're not going to get a choice shortly. They don't need to be made to feel it's worth it, they just need to be told, look, you do it or you don't get your benefit. I don't think that's fair either because well, those the world are... isn't fair. One of the best lessons you can give to a young person is that the world isn't fair. You start convincing them the world's fair, then life's ruined. They might start expecting everybody else to be fair. They don't offer a lot though on YTS. I know they don't. Why should they? You don't do a lot. So tell me, why should they? Well, you don't appear to know. Yeah, they just, if they Why offer, should if they, they offer a lot? So then they've got more choice, and then they can choose exactly what they want to do, and then they... How much more choice will you get if they just give you more money? How much more choice? If, if, you, you, if they there are give three courses, they could give a lot three, more choice. If there are three courses available, and each pays 27 quid a week, if they make each pay a thousand pound a week, there'll still only be three available. You won't have any more choice, will you? Well, they could... They could make it so you come out with better qualifications. Listen, they could they give do. you a thousand quid a week and make it so you come out with a degree, but tell me why the hell they should. Because I just think it'd be a lot better and it'd cut down the unemployment. Well, a it's lot cutting more. it down now. They're saying you either do it or you don't get any money at all. That'll cut it down, all right? See, with this YTS, I feel that the employers where pe young, youngsters are getting full-time jobs, the employers are saying, well, they only get £27 on the YTS, why should I pay any more? They should be grateful for an extra £5 or whatever. So? Why shouldn't they be grateful for the extra five quid? They are. Uh, what, 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 what do you think a 17-year-old is worth as an employee? They know now, they can do now, they're a waste of time. The more trouble than they're worth. Why should you give them anything at all? They should because pay they're you. still learning the trade that's going to be carried on all right, after they've so, gone. So is it true that you agree that they're not worth out? They can't do out? They can do something. Well, what are they learning then? They're what learning can, the trade that... What trade? You said they can do something. What can they do? They can do almost anything. What almost they anything? Do, what they, means they something they can do? What can they do? They can do whatever they want. If we, if they, no, they really, can't do whatever they, they want. Do if we get a YTS person in here, what are they going to do? What they're going to do? Yeah, if I they're interested you. in. Um, I'm asking you what they're going to do, not if they're interested in all that crap. What they're going to do? They're going to learn what they're going to. I thought you said they could do something. They either can do it or they can't do it. If they well, can do it, they well, don't they need to learn do it. it. They would advertise, uh, set up their well, own listen, business, but they listen, can't. Listen, when you learn. listen to me, for crying out loud, you're obviously a YTS because you're thick. Here's the question again Do they know it or have they got to learn it? Which?